Brighton's Grand Hotel is instantly recognisable. It was, of course, front page news around the world in 1984. For many people, this building is still indelibly associated with terrorism. But the Grand had earned its place in history long before the IRA checked in. This place is a treasure house of stories, whether your interest is engineering, social history or scandal. And despite 140 years of fashion and one night of terror, it's still here to tell those stories. To modernise, the Grand Hotel is rather like some stately old lady. But she didn't always appear so frumpy and conventional. In her salad days, people thought she was a rather radical and sexy young thing. They'd never seen anything like her. Before Queen Victoria came to the throne, there weren't really any hotels in Britain. Nothing this grand, anyway. There was no need. In those days, only the rich travelled for pleasure, and they went to Europe. But as the 19th century progressed, tourism became increasingly affordable, and a new tourist industry was born. In those days, Thomas Cook was a real person, not a high street chain. You wrote to him to organise an excursion. You no longer needed to be as loaded as the Prince Regent to finance a day out on the coast. He hadn't stayed in a hotel, of course. He built his own modest little residence. The future George IV was the trendsetter who opened the way for an army of candy floss chewing, donkey riding, jelly dummy sucking hedonists. But it was the growth of the railway system that brought this species of pleasure to a wider public. In 1843, the Brighton Railway Company began regular services from London. And in less than 20 years, this town was being visited by 73,000 Londoners every week. Roland Hill had invented the excursion train three years after he created the Penny Post. But his latest bright idea meant Brighton's lodging houses were full to bursting. Something had to be done, and it needed to be something big. So up went the grand. An unprecedented 260 rooms required 450 tonnes of wrought and cast iron and three and a half million bricks. The press was overwhelmed by its vast frame, its superincumbent mass. In 1864, a seven-storey structure in Brighton had as much impact as the Empire State would have in Manhattan 70 years later. That's why they called it the Grand and didn't feel they were labouring the point. Victorian architects had rarely dared to build this high. It's not that people objected on aesthetic grounds, but because they were afraid about the effect on their knees. Like the old prostitute said, it's not the job that gets you, it's the stairs. And paying guests didn't want to yomp up several flights, not with all those trunks they had to carry. Rooms got cheaper the higher up you went. The top floor was for servants only. The notion of a luxury penthouse was a contradiction in terms. But the Grand changed all that with the introduction of a swanky new piece of technology. The world's first direct action passenger lift. Elevators were still a very new and strange idea. The American Mr Otis had invented his safety system just ten years before the Grand was built. Early models were hydraulic. Water tanks were stored in the Grand's twin towers. The pressure of their contents falling down 60 foot sent the lift up into the air. At first, people didn't know what to make of them. They didn't even know what to call them. Ascending rooms was one idea. Upstairs omnibus, another. Is it just me, or does that sound a bit smutty? Journos tried to explain the new sensation to their readers. Without any sensation of motion, we wait a few seconds and we find ourselves on the upper floor of the building. We are assured there is no danger. At least one writer considered the upstairs omnibus to be the shape of things to come. It may perchance turn out that lofty hotels really will be more handy than those of lesser height. And here's something handy. In a high-rise hotel, nothing gets in the way of the view. One early visitor who scaled these heights was one of the best-known faces of the 1870s, Napoleon III. 
Crowds of people gathered here to catch a glimpse of him. Errand boys whistled and catcalled till he came out onto the balcony, and then everybody cheered and threw their hats in the air. It was the best show in town. 19th century people loved to be beside the seaside. And there was plenty to keep them amused. The same year as the Grand opened, Brighton's West Pier turned on its gas lights. Over the years, the town became stuffed with possibilities for pleasure. By the start of the 20th century, Brighton had become a true mass market destination. The Edwardian Benidorm, offering sea and shingle and slap and tickle. Brighton became the home of the dirty weekend. Bang in the middle of the adultery capital of Britain, the ground found itself regularly cited in divorce cases. In the interwar years, the easiest way to secure a legal separation from your spouse was to hire somebody to act as co-respondent in your case. You'd come to the Grand, you'd check in with this person, you'd climb into bed with them, and then you'd ring for the maid. After the maid had clocked you lying next to your hired lover, you were then forced to spend the night in the room, just for appearances sake. You could play whist or maybe order a cold collation. Even if nothing dirtier than lettuce munching had gone on in the room, you could check out knowing that the maid would be able to swear blind in court that you'd committed adultery. And hey presto, the marriage was dissolved. Everyone was at it, even the aristocracy. A visit to Brighton became a byword for unauthorised sex, a nudge and a wink to the newspaper reader. But the biggest sex scandal to have occurred at the Grand wasn't about adultery. It involved a much more unusual form of deception. When Colonel Victor Barker moved into the Grand in the autumn of 1923, he was just the kind of guest whom the management were falling over themselves to attract. Respectable army man, popular with other gentlemen guests. The life and soul of any swimming or tennis party. Always ready to oblige with a stirring story of his military exploits. And he was a good tipper, which helped when he moved a lady into his room. But he soon made an honest woman of Elfrida. And the honeymoon, of course, was taken at the Grand. Six years later, Victor Barker had got into dubious company. He'd joined the British fascists. He'd also fallen on hard times, and that was the cause of his undoing. Barker was imprisoned for bankruptcy, and in prison he was asked to remove his vest. The wardens were surprised to see evidence that the colonel wasn't entitled to his rank. Victor was Valerie, Valerie Arkell Smith. Women impersonating men were all right on stage, but when they did it in registry offices, it was headline news and a police matter. Valerie was imprisoned for stating that she was the groom on the marriage certificate. She'd done the very opposite of making an honest woman of Elfrida. After emerging from jail, Smith resumed her life as a man, but her notoriety made employment difficult to find. By the 1930s, she was reduced to exhibiting herself at Blackpool Pier. By then, her days at the Grand with Elfrida must have seemed like paradise. Real colonels arrived en masse in Brighton with the coming of the Second World War. Brighton's beaches were closed in 1940, as were its hotels. The Grand was requisitioned by the RAF. The fine furniture was stripped out, the suites became crowded dormitories filled with camp beds, and there was an invasion from down under. In the closing years of the war, Brighton's two biggest hotels were used by the Australian and New Zealand Air Forces. Most of the officers ended up here. Once hostilities had ceased, it took some time to bring the buildings back up to scratch. All those chads scribbled everywhere, all those drawing pinholes from posters of Pat Rock in a cable-knit sweater. But the Grand was to face a challenge much greater than redecoration. The British seaside resort sank into decades of decline. It was deeply unfashionable. It was where spivs and razor boys went to bash each other's lights out. Nice people, people with a bit put by, began to send off for the brochures for Spain and Greece. The Grand tried to get groovy, but the attempts were dad at a disco horrid. 
it didn't help that buildings of the Grands period were by now regarded as hopelessly old hat. This thing used to be one of the most beautiful buildings of Victorian Brighton, the Bedford Hotel. It was rebuilt in the 1960s when architecture like this was considered more progressive and hygienic. The Grand too had a narrow escape from the wrecking ball. The council wanted to replace it with a modern concrete amusement arcade and had gone as far as issuing a compulsory purchase order for the site. But at the last moment, the demolition was halted when national government stepped in. Unlike other seaside hotels, the Grand wasn't converted into flats or a nursing home. It kept busy thanks to the activity which its piggledly neighbour was designed to host, conferences. Suited bores banging on about growth forecasts and risk assessments wasn't the kind of glamorous good time envisaged by the creators of the Brighton Grand. But conferences, no matter how dull, brought guests, loads of them, even at those times of the year when the British weather couldn't be relied upon. You know, those months between August and the end of the following July. The Grand became a conference favourite for all the political parties. Harold Wilson held a cabinet meeting in this suite, a very rare occurrence outside Downing Street and Chequers. The Conservative Conference in 1984, however, is the one for which the Grand will always be remembered. The hotel had undergone refurbishment that year, but all that work was undone on October the 12th at 2.54 a.m. It's a story which has, of course, been thoroughly told elsewhere. Five people were killed in the attack, though the principal target, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, escaped unharmed. The death toll could have been much higher if the bomb had exploded in a hotel made of modern, lightweight materials. History protected the guests, according to the architect who was immediately put in charge of rebuilding the ground. The building is a sound building. It's a Victorian building, a very strong building. You see, the walls are very uh, heavy walls, but still it got a hell of a knock. It's like a chain reaction, you know. The bomb ha happened in the middle of the hotel, but we had to immediately investigate all the other parts of the hotel, whether they can be, in fact, secure and safe. This wasn't just a, a restoration job, was it? It was something much more symbolic than that. It was the, uh, important to the government of the country to show that the building is not uh, actually demolished and uh, it uh, managed to withstand the, the horrific event. And uh, that's why it was on the news all the time. There was never any question that the hotel might be rebuilt in a 20th century style then? No, we, we, we used some uh, modern uh, uh, materials, you know, because, uh, you know, some of the molding, of course, to do those modeling today, it was almost impossible. So they were done with uh, new materials, mm -hmm. but uh, they look the same. Mm -hmm. So as an architect, sometimes you have to respect the past. Mm -hmm. And the Victorian architecture had very good features mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. And it was a challenge. It was a building challenge, basically, to get this building live again. Mm -hmm. Margaret Thatcher reopened the hotel less than two years after the bomb. During the restoration, Egal Yarvets had added new rooms and facilities, all in sympathetic style. As a result, the hotel gained five-star status for the first time. And beyond the Grand's doors, another renaissance was taking place, that of Brighton itself. In the 1980s, this place was down on its luck. It was shabby, it was seedy, the mods and rockers weren't fighting on the beach anymore, but it was still no place to take the family, unless, of course, you're one of those unfortunate ones living on benefits in a death trap DSS bed and breakfast. Brighton was the Costa del Dole. Bit by bit, though, Brighton got its groove back, and its money, too. Smart Londoners returned on day trips. An army of fashionable downshifters bought houses and flats here. The Grand is now surrounded by one of Britain's youngest and most fashionable cities, and after nearly 150 years, it's looking better than it has for decades. Sadly, the same can't be said for the other Brighton landmark, which opened at the same time as the Grand. 
The Grand isn't Brighton at its hippest. It's not full of the 21st century equivalent of all that smart set who flocked here in the 1860s. But there's one quality that it still has in spades, grandeur. And for the first time since the 1930s, the hotel is living up to its name. 